As always, I'd like to thank our sponsor, uh, With Secure. Having With Secure as a partner helps you understand and address the cyber risks associated with business transformation, embedding outcome based cybersecurity measures tailored to identifying unknown unknowns and to designing mitigations. I'll take QA after the talk. Please raise your hand and we'll bring the mic to you. Uh, please welcome our speaker, Josh. Thanks. Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining me today. Um, my name is Josh. This talk is called Billion Served. And today I'm going to talk about some of the challenges that security teams face when they're doing uh, event processing, um, how we solve that where I worked, uh, where I work, and how you can solve similar problems in your organization if you use the AWS serverless stack. So I'm going to kick this off by sharing a bit about myself. I've been working in the security industry for just over 10 years. My niche in the industry isn't cloud security, actually. It's security operations, um, which includes the practices of threat intelligence, detection and response, and threat hunting. Um, I'm a security engineer and tech lead at Brex, and everything in the presentation today is derived from work I've done there. Um, you know, something that really motivates me at work is making life difficult for bad guys. And I think that that's usually best done by sharing information with others and then also building tools that other people can use. Um, and that's kind of why I'm giving this talk today. Um, and you know, security operations can be really interesting, mostly because we aren't dealing with things like unpatched servers or misconfigured IAM policies. What we're usually dealing with are people that want to cause harm to our organization, either disrupting our operations or stealing information. And it's hard to explain just how cool it is to observe and disrupt an attacker who's in your environment. And you only really get that experience when you're in security operations. Um, but I'm not here to tell you about cool stuff like that. Instead, I want to tell you about something you won't hear from anyone else, um, which is that if you work in security operations, then eventually you become a data engineer. And I think that's probably disappointing to some people. Um, but it makes sense if you think about it, because data is at the basis of everything that a security operations person does. We collect lots of data. We analyze lots of data. We use all that data to make um, sometimes high impact decisions that impact our, our business. And one of the ultimate goals of doing that is to identify a compromise. But unfortunately, we actually spend most of our day dealing with things like this. So. If you recognize what this is, um, then I guess I'm sorry, because that probably means you either work in security operations or you might have an exciting future in it. And you know, the problem is that the vast majority of the data we use for our jobs isn't conducive to making accurate decisions. So we spend a lot of our time reshaping data, joining data to fit whatever we're investigating. And what this shows is that there's two problems with security event logs. First, they inconsistently describe artifacts and activity. And second, they rarely contain all the information we actually need to, to make decisions. And um, you know, by the way, if you're, if you're a fan of alternative security data platforms like a data lake or a data warehouse, then you're not really off the hook either because those things don't solve this problem either. They just make it a different problem. So I've worked on these types of problems for most of my career. And as I was writing this talk, I wondered a couple things. Like, how did we get to this point? How did it happen? And can we make things better? And I think that um, explaining how this happened is pretty easy and maybe kind of scary for some folks in the room, or at least in that other room over there. And the reality is that most security operations team have teams have systems that look like this. They buy a security platform from a vendor, and that vendor gives them some tools to collect data from their servers and services. And that platform has you know, some data transformation tools built into it. It's usually limited to things like simple data connectors or functions for doing search time analysis, which is what you saw earlier. And the problem is that this creates expertise in that platform but it doesn't really solve the problem of making data more valuable or making it easy to use. 
And so the result of this architecture is that you know, teams lose the ability to manage their data and have they eventually have limited options for actually improving it. And you know, in my opinion, to put it very bluntly, if this is your architecture for ingesting security event logs, then your team will be stuck writing ugly queries for a very long time. So how do we fix it? It's, it's honestly pretty simple. Um, we just need to decouple some of these functions. And I think it's worth mentioning that what I'm saying right now is obvious to anyone in the data engineering space. But I don't hear the, about these concepts from security operations people very often. Um, but the problem is that if we use this architecture, then we have a new problem, which is that we still need to get data from the servers to the security platform, and now there is an empty space that we need to fill. Well, um, at Brex, we filled that space by building a tool called Substation. So Substation, it's an open source data, pla uh, data pipeline toolkit, and it's designed to solve this specific problem. Um, of giving teams control over their data. In my opinion, it's built by probably the best people you could want to build it, which is a team of security engineers who have dealt with and been working on this problem for years. It's um, kind of difficult to demo live, but let me walk you through what it does. So everyone knows what this is. It's a CloudTrail event. This one happens to describe a user logging into the AWS console. So Substation takes an event like this and turns it into this. It's the same data, but it's normalized to a common schema and enriched with information that CloudTrail has no clue about. So this seems like really simple, but it's a game changer for the capabilities of a security operations team and is actually a really hard problem to solve affordably at business scale. But Reshaping event logs, I, I don't think, is the coolest part. The cool part of all this is that um, this project lets teams build whatever data architecture they want. So what we've built is a toolkit, not a platform. Some fun designs on this slide that you could build it includes complex notification systems using SNS, replicating data from DynamoDB to other services, and um, a really common use case you'll hear other vendors talk about is splitting your data between your SIM and your data lake. And this is in addition to all the data transformation use cases that's at the center of every design. Um, so I'm a big fan of open source software. And whenever I hear about a new project, I immediately have a few questions that run through my head, like, how reliable is it? Will it scale to my environment? How much will it cost me to run this thing? Um, so I thought I'd just answer those questions for everyone right now. We've been using it in production for, I'd say, a long time. And every day we process billions of events from over dozens of unique data sources that span our entire business and uh, product. And that's not limited to just cloud infrastructure. Um, and as a part of that, we end up executing just millions of data transformation functions every second. But I think the most impressive part is that you know, the cost to run this for us is around one cent to five cents per gigabyte of data processed. And maybe even mo like more impressive than that is that we spend less than an hour per week maintaining it. It's all designed to just maintain itself. Um, and that metric is including like hundreds of resources across tens of AWS services that's involved. So, when we started building this, having a system that scales, it's affordable, it's easy to maintain, those were all requirements you know, when we started this project. Um, here's a graph of our event volume. This is eight months from October through April. The blue line is uh, events processed per day, that's in billions, and then the orange line is data stored in Kinesis, that's uh, again per day, and that's per terabyte. Um, I think these days we're three and a half to four billion events per day and eight to 10 terabytes in Kinesis per stored per day, something like that. Um, but you can see we've had like some pretty extreme periods of growth and retraction and things like that. Um, it's not the biggest scale I've ever worked at, but it's, it's still pretty interesting. So, okay, so the way the rest of this talk will go is, is sort of like this. I'm gonna talk about three services 
um, Lambda, Kinesis, and DynamoDB. And I'm gonna describe like one critical way that we've optimized them for this use case and go deep there and then give you some other tips as well for optimization and then close out the talk with some you know, gotchas and things you need to watch out for if you try to build this your own, on your own. Um, and by the way, everything I'm gonna talk about is built into Substation, so if, if you have an immediate need for this kind of solution, I would recommend you just check out that project instead of building your own or, or buying something from a vendor. Um, so um, this is gonna be pretty dense, so, so hang tight. Um, let's start with Lambda. So I think everyone knows that Lambda is you know, concurrent. Like this, that's, that's like the whole selling point of the service is that it's concurrent compute and it's serverless. But um, I'm actually gonna focus on parallelism. Um, but we do have to talk about concurrency just a little bit. So between those two concepts, you have like three levers you can pull when you're optimizing Lambda. One of those is one you really don't have much control over, which is that the event source that triggers your Lambda determines the base level of concurrency. And there's two types, really. There's like one-to-one -one execution and then many-to-one execution. Things like S3 notifications, API gateway requests, those are one-to-one um, -one execution. Like one notification, one invocation of the Lambda container. Um, but then there's, there's many to one services, and those are the ones we tend to use, like Kinesis and DynamoDB. So instead of the Lambda retrieving um, a single record from Kinesis, it'll retrieve in batches of 500, 1,000, whatever you configure. Um, and then if you use Kinesis and also DynamoDB, you have this option to use something called the parallelization factor setting. I won't go into too much detail on that, but Essentially, it's just a way to split that batch of records into a smaller batch that fans out and is processed by more lambda. So if your configuration was 1,000 records and you had a P factor of 10, then you'd send 100 records to 10 lambda, something like that. Um, but I'm actually not gonna talk about any of that because it's all well-documented. What I wanna kind of emphasize is multi-threading. Um, we've seen a lot of performance impact Po like positive performance impact by having multi-threaded applications in Lambda, which isn't a recommendation I see very often, because I think people think that Lambda are meant to be simple, um, and why would you ever need to have multi-threading or multi-processing inside of a Lambda? Um, this is just a visual representation of you know, a previous slide, kind of just emphasizing that even if you're pulling from a single source, there are ways to do um, parallel data processing. So, with Lambda, we've seen a lot of performance benefit when we're dealing with I.O. bound tasks, mostly network. Um, so data transformation use cases are usually CPU bound. Um, you're limited by however much CPU you have. Um, but some of the best data um, to use to enrich your security event logs isn't anything that you know in your organization. It's what someone else knows about your data. And so that's when we end up you know, querying an external service to, to enrich our data. And we do that at scale for all the billions of events we process every day. Um, and that changes it from a CPU bound problem to an IO bound problem. And a thread pool, you know, how you design your application, can improve performance because what you do is instead of processing a thousand records serially and calling an external service, you suddenly split that into five workers that all call that service um, and you're just depending more on the, um, the, the, you're reducing the latency of the entire runtime of your application. Um, and there's just dozens and dozens of use cases for this. Um, you know, I think one of the really common ones that like big vendors have support out of the box is doing um, DNS resolution. So take an IP address and do a reverse lookup to get the DNS domain that's associated with that address. There's other edge cases there that are a little more interesting, like doing text record lookups. Um, and then, you know, most of the enrichment services that security operations teams use, they are just based on, based on HTTPS and on the web. So location-based services, reputation services, threat intelligence especially. Um, in our project, we also support using Lambda as an enrichment. So you can call other Lambda in your environment if you need to hit like an internal API or if you have some custom data processing use case that we don't support, you can just execute a Lambda. 
and it's all uh, very efficient. So yeah, I have slides like this throughout the presentation, which are in some cases things you could probably find on Google, but also in some cases things you probably would have to watch like a 40 minute YouTube video to find. Um, but the thing I want to focus on here is app config, because I don't know that a lot of people know what this service is or use it, um, but app config is an AWS service that is hosted configurations. And I don't recall if it's the Lambda team or the app config team that maintains this, but there is a Lambda extension that you can deploy as a layer that will just continuously retrie uh, retrieve your configurations from app config and make it available to your Lambda through a local HTTP endpoint. It's a great way to avoid cold starts um, and creates really efficient CI CD processes for when you want to keep your Lambda up and running, but not um, restart it to pull a config. I'm a big fan of it, and I don't see a lot of people talking about it. Um, OK, Kinesis. This is maybe the most interesting part of this talk, in my opinion, which is that the story of optimizing Kinesis is all about achieving absurd data throughput and saving ridiculous cost. Almost feels like you're pulling a trick on the Kinesis team when you do some of this stuff. And it's all in their documentation, too. They tell you to do this, but I don't actually see many people doing it. Um, so you want to aggregate as many events as you can into a single record up to like a threshold that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and that's how you get really high data throughput and save cost. They, you know, give libraries to do this, which I, don't, again, don't see many people talking about, um, the KPL and KCL. But you really don't even need to use those. Like, any kind of data aggregation will work. Um, you know, put a 1,000 events into a JSON array, put that into a record, send that to Kinesis, any type of compression. It's really flexible. Um, so why this matters is kind of complex. But, you know, under the Kinesis, I guess, product suite, there's multiple things that provide you a stream, but they all have different billing models. And how you aggregate your data has a big impact on your Kinesis costs. So um, for the most part, they bill based on the record size, and they bill based on the number of events you put into the stream, or records you put into the stream. Um, if you look at this first row, that's 10 megabytes per second, so around 800 or so gigabytes a day. Um, and I've got provision data streams, firehose, on-demand data streams, and MSKs there as a reference point if you don't want to use Kinesis and want you know, Kafka instead. Um, but what you'd notice is provision data streams is always the most affordable option. Firehose and on-demand are kind of a wash. They're both real expensive. And then MSK is somewhere in the middle. Um, but things get interesting if you look at the bottom three rows, because those are all the same data throughput, around 100 megabytes a second. It's just over eight terabytes a day, something like that. Um, but you notice there's different configurations of record size and then also uh, record volume. Um, and if you look at on-demand and MSK, the cost of that per day is flat because they're primarily billed based on data throughput. So it doesn't matter the configuration of records going in or the size, it's 100 megabytes uh, per second. But um, if you look at firehose and, and provision data streams, for Firehose, as soon as you go to five kilobytes per record, um, you reduce your cost by about three and a half, four x, just by doing a little bit of aggregation. Um, it's even more dramatic with data streams because their threshold is 25 kilobytes a record. So if you hit that, you do the same, essentially the same cost savings. It's about three and a half, four x, um, just by doing a little bit of aggregation. Um, it's you know, not a lie to say that at scale, this can save you hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. Um, and you really just need to build your applications in a way that they can aggregate and deaggregate, which which ours can by default. Um, so there's additional costs as well. Like, I wouldn't always say that you want to use Kinesis versus Kafka. There's a lot of reasons to use Kafka instead of Kinesis. Um, some of them include things like if you have a lot of consumers consuming off the stream but not a lot of producers producing to it, that might be a use case where you want to use Kafka instead. The way this actually works out with um, data streams is that if your cost at like two consumers is $100 per day and you go to three consumers, you're adding a 10% increase due to the read limitations of Kinesis. So it's like 110 and on and on and on. Um, 
enhanced consumers probably just don't use them because the costs are ridiculous. Like not only in the what they're charging you for the data throughput with the gigabytes, um, but they also charge shard hours, which is the pri uh, when you do record aggregation, shard hours is the primary cost for Kinesis, and you just really want to avoid that. Um, I won't say too much about Firehose except to say that you're really paying a high price for all the convenience it gives you. So, you know, we chose to build a, a project that doesn't really use Firehose. It integrates with it if you want it, but I wouldn't recommend you use it with Substation um, if you're looking at that, just because these costs really add up over time. So, the other thing about Kinesis is that, again, lots of ways you can optimize it. You can Google these things to get more information, but the thing I want to focus on is auto scaling. Um, this might be one of the few AWS serverless services that doesn't have a provisioned auto scaling function. So there's on demand, but you've already seen that on demand is ridiculously expensive, and why would you ever use it for that reason? Um, and then you have a corollary to this, which is DynamoDB has a provision capacity mode that does have auto scaling built in. So for whatever reason, Kinesis does not have this. Um, but we've actually gotten a lot of value out of, out of building our own autoscaler to just change the size of our streams um, just based on business operations. So what you notice is like when you, when you kind of solve these problems is security event logs, they, they like ebb and flow with, with the business. So when the business is noisy, the event logs go up. When the business is quiet, the event logs go down. And it doesn't make sense to pay, you know, for for your peak efficiency with your Kinesis shards. Um, so we have a, we have an autoscaler. Highly recommend you you figure that out if you're a Kinesis user because you can again save tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. The um, so the last service I'm going to talk about is DynamoDB, and this is probably my favorite serverless service. Um, which I think would probably surprise most people because I don't hear about its use quite a lot in these kinds of use cases. Um, but it, the reason is it really unlocks like so much potential for everything else we do. And you'll, you'll kind of understand why in here in a moment. But the primary use case for it is as a distributed cache for enrichment data. So I mentioned we do a lot of data enrichment. Um, the reason why that's scalable is because we use DynamoDB as a cache for that. Um, I'll get into what a cache aside pattern is here in a moment, but that is like the secret sauce of, of what we do. Um, we're also really heavy users of um, DynamoDB's time to live feature. So you, if you're not familiar with what that is, you put, a re you put an item into the table and you give it a time to live, say two hours or seven days, and the DynamoDB DB service will remove the record um, from the table at that time. Um, that'll make more sense here in a moment when I walk you through this diagram. The, um, the way the distributed cache works is essentially that you have hundreds or thousands of Lambda all running at the same time, and they're all connected through a DynamoDB table. So they're all reading from that table, they're all writing to that table, and they're all typically um, performing this cache aside pattern you see here on the right. And so what the cache aside is, is that the Lambda will query the table, look for a result. If the result isn't there, it'll hit an external service that's usually like one of our um, threat intel providers or reputation providers, something like that, get the result, and then put the result back in the table. So what you end up with is just thousands of processes that are all racing to get the, the most like recent result from DynamoDB, and then if it doesn't exist, they all race to query our external uh, service. Um, and that's the way we're able to do, you know, billion event scale, like data enrichment for everything um, across our enterprise. And then the other advantages of DynamoDB is that it's just, because it's serverless, it's so easy to integrate with other services and other teams as well. So you can use it as a more of like a static lookup where an external service would just push data into it that you read from. Um, but the most compelling use case that I've seen is using it as basically just the place where all your data hangs out and shares information with each other. So we actually use it in a way where any event log anywhere across our enterprise can 
have its data turned into context that every other event log can read from and enrich itself with. So again, just like so many use cases here, I couldn't even think of all the best ones to put on this slide, but this is a great way to solve the problem of having data-driven inventories. So you, know, you have lots of cloud trail logs that tell you about when systems spin up and spin down. That's the use case. Um, as, a, as a read cache for indicators of compromise. Um, but then we've seen a lot of the cost savings in, in, the, in the cache uh, caching API responses, but also um, you can use it to curate business and threat intelligence. So not only being a you know, provider of, of indicators of compromise, but you could also use it to store things that no one is telling you about your business, like when teams spin up servers or um, why you know, servers are being deployed in certain regions that maybe you didn't know about. Um, and it's really just a great way to share data between services. So we use it to share data between all of our data pipelines, but also um, it can integrate with any service that has read access to the table. Um, another thing we do is we, we ship all of our Dynamo D, DB tables with, um, with a change of data capture enabled, which means that when there is a change in the table, it emits a notification that anyone can subscribe to. So it's a really easy way to share information with other teams. Like maybe you have a team that, like one use case we have is we have an eight, like we have a external service it has a really constrained API limit. We can't give other teams access to that data, but we can give them notifications when we enrich our data with it. And because we're enriching data, this data at scale, um, their data just happens to be a part of that. Um, yeah, more tips for DynamoDB. This, this one is really complex. Um, I think the best one that I can recommend people focus on is um, using an in-memory cache to actually reduce your query volume against DynamoDB. So it's kind of like a, a nested cache aside strategy where you would first check your in-memory cache. If there's a miss there, check DynamoDB. If there's a hit, you bring the result back into your Lambda and keep that, um, that result in memory. Um, the Lambda containers, I think, have a life cycle of like one and a half to two hours, something like that. So this is a surprisingly effective strategy for reducing the load on DynamoDB. Also a great way to save a lot of money. Um, yeah, so now let's talk about when things go wrong because they eventually do when you're building on serverless and making distributed systems. Um, I think the first thing I would think about is the continuous retries. So when, when you're using Lambda with services like Kinesis, the default behavior is to retry until the data expires out of the, the stream. And this also applies to SQS and other services. So that's a really great way to duplicate a lot of data really fast and drive your Lambda costs up. And the only way I've really seen to address this is just have really good alerting practices on, on, your, um, on your metrics. So we use CloudWatch. It's been great for that. Um, and alternatively, dead letter queues. But we, we've gotten our, um, I'd say our engineering response to issues like this down so well that we don't need to use dead letter queues. In, in pretty much any distributed system, back pressure is a concern. Um, I think it's even, even more of a risk with security event logs because they're really bursty. Um, and the best recommendation I have is just don't under-provision. And um, if you want to do that at a like, cost-effective way, you have to use auto-scaling. So if the service supports it, use auto-scaling. If it doesn't support it, build your own auto-scaler. Um, this is really... Um, I'd say a pretty significant risk for any team that does continuous um, security monitoring. Like if you have a threat detection team and uh, a response team that is constantly keeping alerts uh, up to date and, and monitored. Um, the delays with back pressure can go from tens of minutes to tens of hours. Like it really can um, spiral out of control if you, if you don't have this, these kinds of auto scaling features enabled. And I think finally, um, bottlenecks. So bottlenecks are really, diff like again, just a distributed systems problem, not a serverless problem. But bottlenecks are really hard to figure out. But what, what we've seen is that you can use the lambda duration and the iterator age metrics to 
basically identify the issue in pretty much any of these services. Um, and then from there, you just have to debug those services to look at like, are the read requests not being fu like fulfilled um, successfully, things like that in the case of DynamoDB. Um, and then it's kind of like whack-a-mole. You just go through the services to figure out what happened. So with duration, the thing I would focus on is like, let's say your duration on average is 200 milliseconds. And then some, you, you push like a new configuration or update your application code. And then your duration goes to two seconds or beyond. Um, that's probably an indication that you have a bottleneck. The iterator age is more about kinesis. Um, and what you'll see is, what you see when your Lambda can't like process the data efficiently is that that metric just slowly creeps up like a staircase. And that's bad. That's another one that's hard to recover from. Um, sometimes that might just be that you've under-provisioned your Lambda and you increase the memory. Maybe you need more CPU. You, know, you would get that through, through increasing memory. Sometimes um, bumping the P factor up from you know, one to two can help you. Um, but in a lot of cases, what we've seen is that the bottlenecks are usually just a result of one of these other services we're using. Like the Kinesis stream didn't scale the way it was supposed to. And so it's creating a bottleneck in the Lambda because the Lambda is just retrying to, to push on that stream. Or um, I mentioned DynamoDB's autoscaler earlier. So highly recommend you use the provision capacity for DynamoDB in the autoscaling function just know that it has a maximum capacity setting for both reads and writes. So if you say like, yeah, today our max capacity is 30,000 requests per second or however it determines that, and then you scale up 10x one, one day and then you never update that value, um, it won't go beyond whatever number you set there. So you do have to check that occasionally and, and we've gotten into trouble uh, doing, not doing that. So now it's something we look out for. That's um, pretty much it. Thank you for listening. Um, reach out on LinkedIn. If you don't uh, see me in person, you can get the slides on Speaker Deck. Um, when you look at the slides, I've included some resources you can, you can read to do your own optimizations. And yeah, I think we'll open it up for questions now. Thanks. Uh, so you, you flagged a lot of capacity knobs that uh, it seems like we, we, we need to pay close attention to. Provision capacity, numbers of shards, um, uh, uh, caching timelines. Uh, where would you say you spend the most of your time in care and feeding? Like, you've gotten this down to an hour, hour a week or so, but like, what did it take to get there? So... Uh, that sounded like two questions. So what, what, do, two questions. what do we what do we um, what do we spend most of our time on? We we mostly spend our time writing lots of configurations to do data processing. So like most mostly feature development on like how you extract data from the data sources and, and normalize it and enrich it. And most of our errors are there. It's in writing a bad config. It's actually not in the resources and the infrastructure itself. And then the second question was how we spend our time on. Uh, how, how long did it take you to get oh. maintenance and infrastructure tuning down to an hour a week? So when we started working on it, it was maybe three months to production. Yeah. And then you know how all these things go. It's like you have 80% of the solution done within a couple months and then it's like years of just iterating on the last 20% is kind of how it went. We, um, most of the, most of the, what you, s I, I talked about today was done within the first six months. And so we've just been running this like quietly for a couple of years. Awesome. Uh, and then uh, just one other question, like there are a lot of open source related type things that have shown up, whether it be, uh, you know, the new security data lake tools, like the, the Matanos of the world, um, uh, or, you know, observability pipeline stuff, thinking of, you know, data dogs vector. Where do you see this sort of fitting into the ecosystem of, of tools that, that security operations folks might want to pick up? Yeah, I think um, there's a, so I, I think if you think about the slide I showed earlier of the architecture, this sits between your services and users and your systems and your data lake or your mm -hmm. security platform, whatever that might be. Um, probably closer to vector mm -hmm. than something like a okay. all-in security platform. Um, some of the differences include um, 
we take a more like code based approach yeah. in writing configurations. The configurations are all written in JSON at, um, they're highly reusable. Um, all of our infrastructure is managed through Terraform. Um, and it's all serverless. That's the other maybe, difference. Maybe cribblish, just like that kind of stuff. Yeah, I, I, I wasn't going to bring that up, but okay. yes. <laughs> um, anything else? Cool. Sure. Thank you for the great talk. Um, so you seem to have sort of a good opinion of Lambda, which, to be fair, I do so as well. But uh, from my perspective, looks like the common wisdom is that once you reach a certain scale, you should probably be looking to move towards you know Kubernetes and running pods and you know just doing your workloads and that way rather than uh, ephemeral lambdas. Would you elaborate on why you chose to do it that way and what were the benefits? Yeah, so um, it's a good question. So in my opinion, so the team that builds this is really small. I didn't mention that. It's like a few people. And this is not our full-time job. This is like 5% of our job. Um, so we really needed a system that just worked and worked reliably, and we didn't have to think about it. And so I think that's a lot of the advantage of not just Lambda, but the other serverless um, services from AWS. And by choosing Lambda, like the other thing about Lambda is it just has so many great out-of-the-box integrations with these other services. Like we didn't have to figure out how to do like, you know, checkpointing with Kinesis, which you would have to figure out on Kubernetes. Like that was just a hard, hard no for us. Um, building on Lambda, you know, we, we, we made it cost efficient, in my opinion. We made it so it's easy to manage. Like at this point, I've, I've got no interest on going to Kubernetes for our project. Thanks, that was a great talk. Uh, I was wondering, did you evaluate DynamoDB Accelerator as an alternative to your in-memory caching in Lambda? No, but um, just because I haven't had the opportunity to. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, so uh, we're going to take a short break, but there is one more talk in this room uh, before we end the day. So. Uh, short break, come back at 11 o'clock for rolling out AWS infrastructure everywhere with spaceships uh, to end the day. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Thank you.